Okay, so good, everybody, yes. Okay, Martha, Shannon, Mark, Kyle, turn on the videos. Turn on videos, yes, okay. Okay. So hello everybody. My name is Tamer Osman and I will be the chair for this session. Uh, let me start first by presenting uh, the first section of our uh, session today. Uh, it's uh, given by Simon Tad, University of California, Jeremy Nibble, University of Toronto, Janet King, University of Canterbury, and Jennifer Hay, University of Canterbury as well. Please type your questions in the chat box. Then I will pick them. And please mention to who you are addressing the question. Okay, thank you. Let's start with Simon. Simon, yes, could you please start your presentation? Okay, and great. please share your screen with us. Yes, How's please. That? Can you see that? Yes, perfect. All righty. Perfect. Uh, Thank you. Tēnā katoa. Um, hello, everyone. Greetings from Oto Tahi Aotearoa, uh, Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, okay, I am excited today to yes. um, share uh, this work with you on uh, phonological influences on lexicalized compound formation in Māori. Um, this is joint work with Jeremy Needle, Jen Hay, and Jeanette King um, that began when we were all together at Te Kahui Rororeo, the New Zealand Institute of Language, Brain, and Behaviour. Um, so the, the big picture, uh, setting the scene for the talk today, uh, we start from the observation uh, that language is constantly changing. Uh, and recent work in language change uh, has taken an evolutionary perspective on the lexicon in which words compete with each other for survival. And when you think about evolutionary perspectives, then you probably think about Darwin uh, and you think about survival of the fittest. Yeah. So in this context, uh, what survives tells us what is linguistically fit um, and gives us some insights into what it means to be linguistically fit. So uh, in this study, we are studying lexicalized compounds in Māori, uh, and we're asking questions, uh, what gets to lexicalize and why? So what survives and what does that tell us about linguistic fitness? Uh, so I wanna begin by just um, laying out some background. Uh, so first of all, why are we looking at compounds? Well, uh, firstly, compounds exhibit uh, competition uh, at any particular point in time. So if you look at this object on the screen, uh, you might think of a couple of names for it. Um, for example, blackboard or chalkboard. Um, you might even uh, possibly... Apologies. <laughs> it's okay. Um, what, yes. At what point uh, did sorry. I get muted? Yeah, please could you repeat the last sentence because that is not recorded. Repeat the last sentence. Once again, we're sorry because that is like really, uh, okay. the sound was unmuted and that is not recorded. Okay. okay. Um, so let me just recap um, from 
uh, this slide. Uh, so we are interested in compounds because um, there's competition between different uh, forms referring to the same word, different compounds for the same thing. Um, and compounds uh, can easily be created. Um, and in particular, they're created from known pieces. So they put together existing words, uh, but they, they can be put together in various different ways. You have choices about um, which words you're combining and creating a compound. So there are really wide ranging possibilities from within a known set of options here. And compounds give us an opportunity to uh, potentially combine influences that are parallel to syntax and morphology because they sit somewhere uh, in between. Uh, so for example, uh, we can ask questions about the order in which the components of a compound appear, uh, maybe in parallel to syntactic alternations uh, research that's been done. Um, and we can ask about the choice of components, which items uh, go into the compound in the first place. And this is parallel to something like allomorphy. So we're interested uh, in studying compounds in Māori specifically, um, because Māori has a very small phoneme inventory, just uh, 10 consonants and five vowels with additional length, length distinctions. Um, in addition, it has a preference for short morphemes uh, and very few um, productive morphological processes. So as a result, uh, there are extremely many compounds in Māori. Uh, so just to give you an idea of how this breaks down, um, here are the three uh, morphological processes in Māori, reduplication, affixation, and compounding. Um, all combinations of these processes are attested. Um, and together, they account for the majority of words in the lexicon. Just 16% of words in the lexicon uh, don't involve any sort of morphological process at all. Reduplication, uh, taken together, accounts for about a quarter of words. Affixation, about a third of words. And compounding, uh, which is what we're focusing on today, accounts for about half of words in the lexicon. Uh, and there's a breakdown um, by the different intersections of categories here. And I can return to this later uh, if you're interested in the question and answer period. Okay. So Māori has an extremely high prevalence of compounds. Um, in addition, it is, uh, has been undergoing revitalization efforts for some time now. Um, so new words have been created and still are being created. Uh, and in 1993, uh, Winifred Bauer observed that compounding was the principal productive means for uh, that new word creation. Uh, and finally, um, Māori exhibits uh, a substantial amount of part of speech flexibility, um, which means that the way that a compound is structured is not just a reflection of the syntax. Uh, so for example, the word mate um, can be used as a noun to mean as death, as a verb meaning to die, or as an adjective meaning dead. Um, and because of this flexibility, you can get mate showing up on the left or the right side of a compound. So you have mate pa, meaning hazard, or wai mate, meaning stagnant. Uh, and this is not specific to mate. Uh, it occurs with uh, a lot of different compound components. So just uh, to show you, here are the 10 components that occur across the most compounds uh, in our data set. Uh, and you can see a couple of, uh, the, the graph here is showing um, the proportion of compounds that they occur, they appear on the left or on the right. Um, and you can see a couple of things. Uh, firstly, there are categories. So there are compounds that prefer to attach on the left and com uh, components, sorry, that prefer to attach on the right. Um, and within categories, there's gradients. So uh, these strength, the preferences have different strengths for different components. And I will say at this point that um, it is possible that this gradients um, reflects something about the, uh, for example, um, homophony. So you could have the same form being used um, with different meanings in different compounds. It could reflect uh, use as head or modifier. 
uh, it could reflect this part of speech flexibility that I was talking about, um, but it could also be something else uh, along the lines of things that we've seen for syntactic alternations research. So we're going to try to control as best we can for the other factors today and focus on the something else uh, observation, uh, something else questions. So our research questions today, um, first of all, assuming that compounds may be flexibly, or components in a compound may be flexibly ordered, what influences the order that ends up lexicalizing uh, in the language? So for example, um, ma means white and fiddle means red. Um, and together they make the compound ma fiddle pink. Uh, and so we would ask the question, well, why isn't this instead fiddle ma, um, the components ordered in the opposite way? And secondly, um, what influences the selection of components in the first place? So uh, for example, tea means white also, uh, and is used in a lot of compounds uh, as well. So why don't we have tea fiddle instead of ma fiddle? So today um, we're gonna focus, uh, the, uh, the analysis is going to focus on the first question. Um, but at the end, I will talk about how that can be uh, generalized or extended to the second question. Uh, and in answering this question, we're going to focus on phonological factors. Now we're focusing on phonological factors because they represent known influences at both wor the word and the phrase levels. Um, and so there's a potential here to see those influences being codified in compounds when they are lexicalized. So um, there are a few things that we're going to focus on and I'll walk through each of them. Uh, so firstly, stress uh, at the word level. Um, so stress in Māori, um, a simplified picture is that it seeks out long vowels uh, and otherwise prefers to be left aligned. Um, so you have uh, minimal contrast sets like keke meaning creek, keke meaning armpit, and keke meaning cake. Um, and the underlined syllable is the one that has primary stress uh, in each of these cases. So it seeks out the long vowel um, if there are multiple long vowels, it will choose the leftmost one. If there aren't any, then it will, uh, stress will fall on the first, the leftmost syllable. So the idea for compounds here is that um, uh, potentially components that have long vowels in them may be ordered preferentially before components that don't have long vowels. Um, Another phonological factor that uh, has been observed in Māori is uh, end weight effects. Um, so in Māori, light phrases are ordered before heavy ones when possible. So for example, in this sentence, kaputa uh, katoa ki wahu ngā tāngata o te pā, and it, the sentence goes on, um, this means uh, all the people of the pa came outside. And here there is um, variation. You can order the kiwaho, the blue uh, phrase, and the ngā tangata o te pa, the red phrase. They can be ordered either way. Um, but the order here is the preferred one. Um, so light phrases are ordered before heavy phrases preferentially. And so similarly, we might expect to see for compounds that light components are ordered preferentially before heavy ones. And uh, the final phonological factor that we are interested in here is um, to do with harmony. Um, so Māori has been observed to have vowel harmony and consonant to disharmony in words. So for example, there are a whole lot of uh, words like these ones here, um, where the vowels are the same in adjacent syllables, um, but the consonants have different places of articulation. Uh, and the idea for com compounds then is that the cross component phonotactics, so what's happening between the syllables that are adjacent to that uh, component boundary in the compound um, will influence the order in which the components lexicalize. So um, that's the idea. Uh, we are studying this with a quantitative analysis. Um, so we take uh, 19 and a half thousand words from the Te Aka Dictionary uh, by John Moorfield. Um, we exclude loan words, passives, and closed class words. Uh, and we end up with about 12 and a half thousand words where we don't know the morphological structure of them. 
Um, looking at these words in order to study compounds, we obviously need to know which ones are compounds. Um, so we need some human annotation. So we got two young adult fluent speakers of Māori um, and we gave them this big list of words. Um, we split it up into uh, random lists of a thousand words uh, and gave them to them in written form, which we could do because the orthographic and phonological representations of Māori are very much aligned. Um, and we had them do a task where they identify the parts, uh, if there are any, uh, that make up each word. Um, and we told them this should be based on what most Māori speakers would think. So they would identify these parts uh, and they would separate them by putting a dot uh, in between them. And we had a way for them to indicate when uh, words or parts are unknown to them. I know you'll notice in this task, we've made no mention of meaning um, and that's intentional because uh, reduplication, one of the major processes in Māori uh, doesn't have clear cut um, semantic correlates. Uh, and so we didn't want them to focus on things that they thought were meaningful in particular ways because that may not translate um, all the time. And so this means that they might have focused more on form than um, we might otherwise have thought. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that further uh, in the Q&A if you are interested. Um, so we had them do this uh, to identify compounds. We are focusing here on binary compounds so we extracted words that were known to both speakers, speakers um, that were decomposed identically by both speakers that have exactly two parts uh, where neither part is an affix um, or a reduplicant. So they don't follow a known reduplication template. So this is a very conservative uh, set. This is things that we can be pretty confident are actually binary compounds. Uh, and it gave us just over 2,700 binary compounds. So our analysis, um, we are analyzing four kinds of factors uh, of the sort that I've already described. Um, so the possible parts of speech of the component. Um, now remember the parts of speech are flexible. Um, so we are counting whether it can be used as noun, verb, modifier of some sort, um, not whether it is one or the other. Um, type frequency of the component, meaning how many compounds does this component show up in? And these two things together are our controls for something like headedness, uh, which we don't have direct access to um, on the assumption that uh, you know heads are ordered, uh, generally heads are ordered on the left, modifiers are ordered on the right. Um, and so parts of speech and type frequency gives us ways of trying to check if those general assumptions are true. And then above and beyond the controls, we are looking at the phonological properties of the component that I already described and the cross component phonotactics. And we are considering cases where the components differ with respect to these factors. Um, so for example, where one component has a long vowel and the other one doesn't. So in terms of the analysis, uh, we use the mixed effects logistic regression analysis. You can think of this essentially as we randomly scramble the order of all of the uh, components in our compounds and then try to predict uh, what factors unscramble it in the correct way. And we have all of these, fact all of these four factors included uh, and random intercepts for the component to control for idiosyncratic properties. Um, in terms of the results uh, for the controls, they uh, follow our general expectations um, from the literature on uh, head modifier uh, ordering. So generally, heads are on the left, modifiers on, are on the right. In terms of our um, the factors that we're interested in, that means um, that when it's possible to use a component as a modifier and not just a noun or a verb or something like that, um, then we see stronger right attachment preferences. Um, and when a compound, when a component occurs in many compounds, then we see stronger left attachment preferences, more likely to be a head. Um, I can show you data for these if you're interested later. Now onto the main uh, topics. Um, so for the phonology, phonological properties of the factors, um, we look first at uh, whether or not the 
component has uh, which component has a long vowel. Um, so on the uh, x axis here, I'm showing the right attachment preference of the component that has the property. So the the component with a long vowel is it more often going to show up on the left or the right? Uh, and I'm showing you just raw data, and then I will report the statistical um, results. So for uh, long vowel. Um, uh, we asking, do we get the long vowel ordered first or second? So we do get something like ma fero or wakato. Um, we see that the long vowels do indeed uh, come up more often on the left, and this is a statistically significant result. Um, for diphthongs, uh, we ask the same question. In terms of the raw data, it looks um, like there's a left attachment preference, but once you control for everything, statistically, um, it is not significant. Um, and in terms of the end weight effects, um, the raw data show and the statistics confirm that the moraically heavier uh, components show up on the right. Uh, now, for the other um, main factor we're interested in, the uh, cross-component phonotactics. So here, the y-axis is going to show you um, the percentage of compounds in which this uh, each pattern is uh, attested or not. So for example, for vowel harmony across the component boundary, do we have vowel harmony more often than not? Um, so in this case, do we have hoodie-witty? where we have vowel harmony or something like manatika where we don't. Um, and we don't have it uh, very often in the raw data. And so statistically uh, significant lack of um, a uh, phonot har vowel harmony effect there. Um, for uh, adjacent vowels, um, the same thing, we get uh, a dispreference for having adjacent vowels, uh, which is statistically significant. And combining these two things, adjacent harmonic vowels is even worse. Um, so the interaction is also significant. And for consonant harmony, um, we see a small, um, but still statistically significant dispreference for that as well. Um, I did have more to say about uh, vowel harmony, but um, due to the muting uh, issue, we're a little bit behind. So I'm going to skip that, but you can ask me uh, if you're interested in the question answer period. Um, okay. I'm going to now uh, go to my uh, conclusions and, and discussion and conclusions. So we have focused here on um, the question of the ordering of the components. Um, but remember, we had this other question about the selection of the components. Uh, so under the assumption that the fitness of a compound is determined both by how conceptually appropriate the components are to express the particular meaning um, and the strength of the ordering preference, then when we have uh, different compounds that uh, have equally or roughly equally conceptually appropriate components, um, the selection of which component uh, will be chosen will come down to uh, a lot to the influence on the ordering preferences. So we think we can get a lot of insight from what we've uh, done here already. And one final um, discussion point, um, how do these phonological influences actually play out? Uh, so we've presented an approach in which they play out when choosing between variants that are already in use, this evolutionary perspective. Um, so then the influences are subtle, they're gradual, they occur at the population level. Compounds themselves may be generated blind to the phonology, and then the phonology will filter candidates in usage uh, across time. But of course, you could have other approaches. Um, for example, at the other extreme, you could say that these influences uh, occur when coining new compounds. Um, so speakers are choosing what kinds of comp uh, compounds to coin. Um, so these then they are, the influences are less subtle, they're instantaneous and individualized. Uh, and that means that compound generation must be sensitive to phonology. And I think there are all sorts of um, uh, options between these two. And I don't think that we have anything that can necessarily 
um, dictate between them. So very quickly to conclude, um, I know we are short on time. Yes. So the lexicon enshrines what is linguistically fit. Um, it contains the vectors of competitions between potential word forms. And in Māori compounds, phonology influences this fitness. Um, so we can think of that as the codification of influences that already exist on words and phrases. Um, and what I didn't show you about the harmony effect was, or what I didn't discuss further, sorry, um, was that uh, they also give us a demarcation of the composite nature. So a good compound is one that wears its compoundness on its sleeve. Um, so two sort of big picture takeaways here then. Um, firstly, evolutionarily, phonology can influence morphology um, in, for, for compounds. Um, and secondly, lexicalized compounds can provide unique insights into this process. Um, so that's it. Thank you for listening. Um, I am happy to take your questions and comments. Yes, um, there is one question here for you. It says, because Maori is going through a process of revitalization, is it possible that first language interference could be determining factor for what types of compounds arise? That's from Thomas. So when you say what types of compounds, um, do you mean the forms of the compounds or the uh, kinds of um, concepts that compound, compounds represent or uh, what specifically there? Can you put in the chat, Thomas? Okay, yes. Could you please elaborate, Thomas, in the chat box so that he can answer the question fully? Thomas, okay. We need some kind of clarification. I see a, um, another question. Uh, yeah, Thomas okay, I will continue the on. second question. Great, this is from Andrew Lamb. Great, Doug Simon, can you comment on the nature of consonant disharmony in the language. Is it significant in CVCV items when the vowels are not identical? I'm curious because if consonant disharmony occurs within words, you might expect consonant harmony at compound edges to reinforce the boundary. Yes. Um, so consonant disharmony occurs in exactly the situations that you've described. So both when the vowels are identical as in the examples that I gave, but also when they're not. So statistically um, across all of those environments, but consonant disharmony in words is a much weaker preference than vowel harmony in words. Um, so the question arises as to, in, in these uh, results, we found that um, though there is consonant harmony in sorry, vowel harmony in words, um, there is vowel disharmony across the, the boundary, which is a cue to the, um, the existence of the boundary. Um, for consonants, we didn't find that. So consonant disharmony in words and consonant disharmony across the boundary, um, but it is weak in both cases. And so I think this just comes down to that um, consonant harmony or consonant disharmony going against consonant disharmony and creating consonant harmony would be a weak cue to the, comp uh, the, the compound boundary in the first place. Um, so instead, a lot of the work is done by the vowel harmony versus vowel disharmony, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you, Simon. There is a clarification from Thomas once again. He says the words in Maori seem to be shorter than in English. So are these speakers interpreting these compounds as affixes 
and not compounds. That's what I meant by first language interference. Oh, I see. Um, no, I think that the there is it is an open question as to whether um, Maori speakers interpret all of these compounds as compounds in the sense of um, in the semantic sense, uh, making uh, similar semantic contributions to the word as they would when they stand on their own. Um, so I'm not sure that we can necessarily get to the bottom of that. The fact that they separated them out here doesn't tell us in which way they separated them out. However, if you were to classify them as affixes, then you would have to ask the question of, well, there are so many of them um, and they are used relatively infrequently compared to the actual affixes that are in the language across types. Um, so classifying them as affixes in this case um, would be a little bit strange, I think. Um, so uh, with regard to the question of whether L1 interference could be the determining factor for, for the compounds, um, the, the revitalization efforts are done from a Māori perspective. So there is real effort to try to avoid any of this sort of interference um, at all. So mm -hmm. I, uh, and there are, this, there is an official body that creates um, new words. Uh, and in that context, they really come from a Māori perspective. Uh, so I think that question, while obviously uh, relevant because the uh, Māori speakers in this body are also English speakers, um, I don't think that it is constraining the, the way that the um, creation process happens. OK. OK, thank you. There is another question. And please uh, watch time, because still I have a few questions here for you. Uh, the next one from Canon Price, he says, how much of the variance did your full model explain in compound component ordering? Um, that's a great question. I'm afraid I don't know off the top of my head. I would have to look uh, back at the, the analysis. OK, maybe you can contact each other by email later on. Mm -hmm. Okay, Another question from Thomas Christopher Hardy. He says, if the speaker in a, a first, first language I believe English this speaker, is a follow up from the previous question. Yeah, uh, then in English, we it only have one word for white, and that's a speaker with only no one word in Maori as well for white. OK, another question from Kadia. Pertusova. In many languages, there are two types of compounds, roughly speaking, phrase like or word like. And they behave differently in terms of headedness order. Additionally, the order of the head in the compounds does not always follow the order of the head in phrases like in English. Have you taken these factors in account in your analysis? Um, we have not delved deeply into classifying uh, components of the compounds as heads or not because we tried um, and it turned out to be extremely complicated. So because of the part of speech flexibility, you can't rely on the syntax. So instead it has to come down to semantics. But of course, for compounds, um, the scope of semantic possibilities is really large. Um, so we created um, a flow chart that we could follow, try to follow through to try to classify um, each of the compounds as to which one is the head and which one is the modifier and what is the way in which they combine semantically. Um, and it turned out to be extremely complicated. So we have not yet had a chance to follow up on it, but that is something that we are definitely interested in doing. Uh, another question from Elizabeth. Is there a proto-lexicon? 
Ah, so this is a reference to our paper that came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, the I, I don't know to what extent this this may be a tongue-in-cheek question, um, but uh, the the fact that there is so much compounding in Maori is, I think, a large uh, a large factor in the fact that there uh, is such an a ready development of a proto lexicon among speakers who don't speak Maori, um, because you see a lot of recurrence of the same items over and over again. Okay. Uh, I have no more questions. Uh, if you are really interested in asking uh, Simon more questions about anything related to his presentation, please email him. You find the email uh, available on uh, the screen. Uh, okay, Elizabeth says, she has a comment. She says that was in response to Ray's concern. Oh, I see. Um, yes. Okay, thank you so much, Simon. We appreciate it a lot. So, uh, Now we will go to the second section of our uh, uh, session today. It's done by Kyle Mauvold, University of California, and I'm sorry for mispronunciation, and Dan Jurevisky, Stanford University, and Mark Norris. I see here Kyle, Mark, yes. Yep. Mark, yes, so hello. he's going to, yes, hi. So uh, Kyle and Dan and Mark. Okay, so who's going to start the presentation? I am, I'll share my screen now. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, please watch time, Mark, please, for some from the beginning. Yeah, are we okay. ready? Thank you. Yes, because we're taking into consideration that uh, there will be questions after your presentation and people just want to clarify some, uh, some points with you yes. as well. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Okay, um, so the title of our talk is Concord Begets Concord, a Bayesian model of nominal Concord typology. I'm Mark Norris. Uh, this is joint work though between myself, Kyle Mahowald and Dan Jurafsky and I'll get us started. Okay. So Today we're going to be talking about uh, nominal concord, or as I'll call it, uh, concord. This is commonly known as agreement with the head noun. Uh, I prefer a more precise definition, the process whereby a modifier in a noun phrase inflects for certain morphosyntactic features of the noun phrase along with the head noun. So some examples on the right here from a language most of you are probably familiar with. Yeah. We have uh, the small houses, versus the small buildings. And in these examples, uh, you'll, you know that the definite article, las or los, and the adjective, pequen, pequeñas, pequeños, changes its form to match the gender, and though not shown here, the number of the head noun inside the noun phrase. Today, we're going to explore a little bit this question of what purpose Concord might serve. Um, Concord as a form of agreement, of course, uh, comes with some morphological complexity. And that complexity, while it uh, provides a communicative benefit, it also incurs some communicative cost. So given this, we are going to uh, explore the question of how one kind of Concord affects the presence of other kinds of Concord. One thing, one uh, effect you might see is what we call a repellent effect. This might be where one form of concord makes other forms less likely because the cost of all this complexity is just too great. The alternative you might see uh, is what we call a sticky effect, which is where one form of concord makes other forms more likely because if you're already doing it, why not just do it some more? Uh, and so what we're going to show today is statistical evidence in favor of a sticky effect, and that is where our uh, talk title comes from Concord Begets Concord. 
so an outline for the rest of the talk. Um, I'm going to begin by taking you through the typological sample of Concord that I uh, created and telling you a little bit more about the uh, what we're going to compare today. And then I'll hand it over to Kyle, who will talk you through a description of the model and then use the model to test some facts about uh, some generalizations about Concord uh, before concluding in the final section. OK. Now, in addition to the Spanish system we've seen, uh, we saw uh, earlier, there are Concord systems that are very, very simple. For example, this uh, example comes from Cueraboro Senni Songai. In this language, there is Concord only in number and only on demonstrative. So we see it here in these are those people. The demonstrative has this plural marker, and so does the head noun. They can also be very complex. I give here an example from Icelandic, these four small snails. In Icelandic, you have concord for gender, number, and case. And you see concord on demonstratives, on numerals, on adjectives, some possessives, although I haven't shown that here. Almost everything in the Icelandic uh, noun phrase can show concord. So it's much more complex than the Kodaboder Senni example. In 2019, I presented the results of a typological survey of Concord systems. Um, the sample contains 174 languages. This is a pared down version of this sample available on WALS called the 200 language sample. In the introduction to WALS, Dreyer and Haspelmath um, give a list of languages that can be removed to increase the geographic and genetic balance. And that's where the 174 comes from. The end result is a sample with 174 distinct genera from 105 total families. Uh, the profile of the samples we were looking for, we're looking for demonstratives, numerals, and adjectives that are modifying overt nouns in continuous NPs. Those last two pieces are critical for the definition, and you can ask me in the Q&A if you want to know why. And then the final important thing to note is that we give what I call an inclusive definition to Concord. So if the grammar described it as infrequent or optional or something like this, we still counted it as yes, as showing Concord in some form. With these criteria, about 60% of the languages in the sample have Concord. Here is the bi-region breakdown of those languages. The important thing to note here is that there is an aerial effect. So it's Concord is noticeably more common in Australia and Africa. Of course, there are Australian languages that do not have Concord, just so happens that all of them in the sample do. Um, and then in it's less common in South America and Papuanesia. Uh, and then it's roughly, it's closer to the worldwide rate of 60% in North America and in Eurasia. We're going to talk about two aspects of Concord today. The first is what features are involved. Uh, Concord commonly occurs for gender or class, number, and case, less commonly for definiteness, person, and other features. The examples I give uh, below all show demonstrative Concord in various types. So on the left, from Yuchi, an American language, we see uh, demonstrative Concord for gender, glossed here with Roman numeral three. In the middle, we see again our example from Quitterboder Senni, where we have demonstrative concord for number. And on the right, we have an example from Nez Perce, another North American language, where there is demonstrative concord for case. So here we see that man both bearing uh, objective case markers. In addition, we're going to talk about variation in concord in terms of lexical category. So uh, Concord, as I said, can occur on most modifiers inside noun phrases. But today, we're going to focus on adjectives, on numerals, by which I mean cardinal numerals greater than one, and demonstratives. So again, here I'm going to show you each of those types showing number Concord. So on the left, we have adjectives in niti. Uh, so small and child here both unambiguously show plural number. In the middle, we, we see uh, Estonian numeral concord for number. So two looms, where both two and loom have the plural suffix. And again, our example from Koiroboro Senni, where we have this uh, demonstrative number concord. 
On the basis of proportional results from my study, uh, I proposed four what I called Concord tendencies, which I give in a schematized format below. So the first is that if a language has a Concord system at all, it's going to have number Concord. And another way of saying this is number Concord is the most common type. The second is that if a language has a grammatical gender system, it is likely to have gender Concord. The third is that if a language has case Concord, it probably has some other form. In other words, case Concord almost never appears by itself. And the last one has to do with locus. So what, we, what I found was that languages that had both adjective Concord and demonstrative Concord were more common than languages that had just adjective Concord or just demonstrative Concord, but not both. Um, the closest anyone has come to considering the relationship between Concord and word order that I'm aware of is Greenberg's Universal 40, which connected the position of adjectives to the locus of nominal inflection. Universal 40 is not obviously specifically about Concord. Uh, it only addresses noun adjective languages. And the key thing is that the presence of inflection on the noun is irrelevant for what Greenberg is considering with Universal 40. But nevertheless, this is sort of what I think of when I think of Concord and word order. And it made Kyle and I wonder uh, what uh, is the relationship between Concord and, and word order? Is Concord more frequent when the modifier follows or when it proceeds? as Universal 40 kind of evokes, if, if not directly um, addressing. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Kyle to pick up. Great, thank you. All right, does that look great? Okay, yeah, so now I want to get to the model components. Um, yes, that's okay. Sorry, I was muted. Okay. Okay, great. Please just start. Yep. Yep, so now we can get to the uh, modeling component. And we have the first question we might want to ask is, well, why build a model for nominal Concord typology? Um, and one answer is that there might be family or area specific effects that affect the way we draw um, our statistical conclusions. We might want to do significance testing, model uncertainty, model multiple linguistic features at once. Um, so the idea that we had here was to build, use this database that Mark built of nominal Concord typology to try to build a quantitative model. And in this case, a hierarchical Bayesian model of nominary concord typology that lets us ask a kind of flexible set of questions about the internal structure of concord data uh, within and across languages. So the basic thing we're trying to do is evaluate uh, a couple of things. One, this question that is in the title of our talk, which is does concord be at concord? Is concord sticky or kind of repellent? And then, other, uh, and then also try to evaluate quantitatively some of the concord tendencies mark uh, already talked about. So the way we do that is with a Bayesian mixed effect regression model, where the thing we're actually trying to predict is basically these language matrices that you see over here on the right, where for a given locus, which could be numeral, demonstrative, or adjective, and a given type of concord, so a given type of agreement in terms of case, definiteness, gender, or number, basically just predict the binary decision, does that kind of concord exist in that language at that locus? So here you can see Georgian. So it's got case concord for numeral monster adjectives and no concord anywhere else. So a data point that we're trying to predict is basically one cell in this matrix. The way we do that is with a Bayesian regression, which consists of a mixture of fixed and random effects. I'm not gonna get into too much detail uh, on the model or the details of the model, other than to give some general intuition for the kind of predictors that we're using here. So the fixed effects include an intercept, which is basically just a bias term for how likely is Concord in general, how likely is Concord, say, for gender. That might be different from how likely you are to see uh, number Concord or case Concord. Uh, and then for locus, so how likely is Concord up to appear in general on an adjective, a demonstrative, a numeral, et cetera. 
Um, we also have a number of walls features in here. So that includes things uh, like, does the nominal occur before the modifier? It, what kind of gender system does the language have? What kind of case system does it have? Uh, and then I think a key element here are these random effects, which we include for area, uh, family, and language. So these basically attempt to model uh, not just how likely are different types of concord in general, but for a particular language area, like Australia, uh, like the Eurasian area, for a particular family, so whether it's uh, Indo-European, uh, and then for a particular language, how like what are the actual parameters and concord uh, likelihoods within each of those? So to give some intuition for that, imagine if we're predicting uh, a very specific data point, such as does the language Yuchi, which is a North American language, have gender concord for adjectives? So to predict that, we've got our fixed effect for gender concord, uh, a gender concord coefficient in general. We've got adjective concord. And then we've got a selected set of these walls features uh, that are going to be Yuchi specific. Uh, and then critically, we also have aerial effects for North America. We have family effects for Yuchi, which is, I think, an isolate in this data set at least, and uh, language specific effects. So a language specific effects for things, you know, within Yuchi, which basically says if we're trying to predict gender concord for adjectives in Yuchi, the model can also look at gender uh, concord elsewhere on, on you know, demonstratives and numerals in Yuchi, as well as other types of concord for adjectives in Yuchi. So basically taking all of that information together, we try to make a prediction. And we can, I think a critical piece of this is that we can then sample from the posterior from the model, uh, which is a Bayesian technique to ask questions about the typological concord space in general, while attempting in some way to abstract away from effects that are specific to any one area or family. So for instance, if you look at just the raw data and say, you know, well, you know, 10% of languages or something have gender concord, and it turns out they're all in one area, that wouldn't be very informative. So that lets us try to ask these questions in a more general way by basically sampling a language from the model with a simulated new language, new family, new area, so for a hypothetical language, and then use those hypothetical samples to ask arbitrary questions about relationships in the model. For instance, we could use those samples to ask what does uh, the correlation structure look like between say the presence of concord on a demonstrative and the presence of concord on a numeral or for types of agreement how like what is the correlation between having gender concord in a language and having number concord a, you know aside from just language specific or family specific or area specific effects and the takeaway result from this slide is that you see a lot of red here uh, which means the correlations are high so this is, I think, an answer to that question, does Concord beget Concord? The answer here appears to be yes. So having any type of Concord uh, on number, on gender, on definiteness, makes you more likely to have some other type of Concord as well, right? So Concord is sticky in that sense. We can also test Mark's Concord tendencies uh, using the model um, by, again, simulating and asking arbitrary questions uh, that we pre-specify. So for instance, his tendency one, if a language has concord, it likely has number concord. To answer something like that, we sample from the model. We simulate language, family, and area effects. We can then filter to only those languages that have at least some concord, basically satisfying the first part of this if statement, and then measure how often it actually you actually see number concord in the simulation. Right. So I'm not going to get into detail for that tendency. Um, that's kind of robustly supported. but. A kind of more interesting one is, well, if a language has grammatical gender system, it likely has gender concord. So to get at that, we're going to sample different kinds of gender systems and then look at the likelihood of gender concord. Uh, and what you see is that, yes, if a language has grammatical gender, it likely has gender concord. But what you also see is that it makes it also, it's also really likely to have number concord, right? So this um, blue bar is also really high for number. Uh, and it's also slightly more likely to have case or definite as concord. So again, this is more evidence that concord is kind of sticky. Mark's tendency three is if a language or lexical category within a language has case concord, it's more likely to have number concord. So to get at this question, we're gonna sample languages which have case concord and then look at if it has number concord also. 
And again, the answer is yes. So this bar is at one because that's kind of part of the definite, the part we're sampling just to make sure it has case concord. Uh, and then if it has case concord, yeah, there's something like an 80% chance that it has number concord. And it's also uh, quite likely that it's going to have gender concord. Uh, the fourth tendency we looked at was if a language has concord, it's more likely that it will have concord of both adjectives and demonstratives than just one or the other. And this is a really robust effect. Um, I think it comes out in the model results even clearer than it does in the raw data, which is that if of languages that have concord, there's a 68% chance that that concord is on both the demonstrative and the adjective, a 15% chance it's only on the demonstrative, a 9% chance it's only on the adjective, and an 8% chance it's on neither. So again, that tendency looks to be robustly uh, supported in the model. And finally, we return to this question that Mark raised about Greenberg 40, which was, does the modifier coming after the noun make it more likely to have concord expressed? Uh, and there we find really no clear evidence uh, for that particular claim. Um, so basically these, uh, the light bar, green bars versus the dark green bars, which are green for Greenberg, um, show uh, basically very similar uh, quantities, which is that whether the noun becomes before the modifier or the noun becomes after the modifier doesn't seem to have a very big effect on whether or not you see concord. And these are none of, none of these are statistically significant differences. Um, possibly with the larger sample, you might see something, but it at the very least, it seems like this is not something that really is uh, an effect that jumps out robustly or uh, in the data. So uh, to conclude, I'll briefly draw some methodological conclusions and then I'll hand it back to Mark for a couple general final thoughts. So methodologically, I think there's a point here, which was that fitting this kind of uh, hierarchical model um, lets you kind of escape the format of just asking a general null hypothesis testing question about some specific pre-specified hypothesis. But by generating these samples from the posterior, you can ask arbitrary questions, um, which I think was one of the ways here we were able to quantitatively evaluate these concord tendencies that have the form uh, if x, then y. So basically we can generate and then filter on x and then look at y. Um, of course, the caveat here is that you know, even a fancy model is only as good as the data that goes into it. Um, so a lot of the work here well, comes from Mark's database of being a typologically uh, diverse and carefully curated data set. Um, and of course, you know, it's not possible to, to get beyond what's in the data. Um, so I will now pass it on to Mark for a couple general conclusions and thoughts. Okay, uh, thank you, Kyle. Oh, we're, we're is... going, Mark, Mark's going to just have Mark's going to say a couple more words. Yeah. Uh, but... Yes. Okay. But please, time. Uh, oh, okay. are we over already? Uh, because uh, there's another uh, sec section three after you, and there is one question for you. Yeah, that's right. But Actually, we're... three questions. Okay. I, think we're, so, I think we're still just under time. Yeah, we'll, we'll finish up really quickly. Um, so at the beginning, we said uh, Concord begets Concord, which we take to mean or to summarize the fact that all the correlation matrices for Concord are positive. If a language has Concord, it's likely to have even more of it. Um, we also teased this idea of that the morphological complexity of Concord should have some payoff. So we are curious about what we might get for all of this concord. Uh, one thing you might wonder is, do we get freer word order to have all of this concord? Sorry, I'm doing this from uh, behind the scenes or something. But anyway, the answer to that is basically unclear. And the reason is it's hard to get a quantitative measure of word order freedom with a sample of languages that is still typologically diverse. We explored this a little bit with the universal dependencies corpus, but that was just sort of too biased towards um, languages that are extremely well documented. And so we feel like the, the results are, were not super, um, not super compelling. But the model at least does suggest that Concord doesn't have an obvious interaction with NP internal word order. And so that makes us think the, the likelihood is, is potentially not strong. You can go to the next one, Kyle. We do want to stress, take a moment to stress the importance of making your data accessible and open for science so that we can improve the availability and quality of these data sets. Just anecdotally, the reason this project exists is because I made my data available online, Kyle found it, and we started emailing and thus began the collaboration. 
But in thinking about the questions we'd like to address, it has revealed that there is a need for more easily accessible and typologically diverse data sets. And so if you've got the time and you've got the energy to work on these things, we wanna really encourage you to do it and to let other people um, use your data. Some of the questions we're interested in exploring in the future, and we've sort of pinged back and forth in our, in our meetings, we're interested in the relationship of Concord and clausal word order. So VO versus OV languages, what's the, what's the relationship? there. The relationship of Concord and morphological economy, thinking specifically here about, um, about separative and cumulative morphology. And finally, some of the challenges to modeling. So right now, Kyle tells me that the model will sometimes predict that a language without gender has gender concord. In, and uh, obviously, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So uh, he's sort of interested in how to improve the model in that way. And that is everything. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, thank you. So we'll come to the first question. Um, it's from André Schwab. What are the alternatives to a continuous MP? Um, I'll take that one. Uh, the alternative is a discontinuous NP. So these are languages where you can say separate a demonstrative um, with non-NP material in between the demonstrative and the noun. And the reason we want to exclude those is we know there are languages where you can double inflection on those kinds of things but when you stick them together, you can't double the inflection anymore. And so we are specifically looking at cases where when the, the noun phrase is at least plausibly continuous, do you get this replication of inflection? Okay, thank you. The second question from uh, Guan Li. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Have you tested this stickness of Concord through cases of the chronic changes in the conquer system in individual languages? Uh, short answer, no. It's a very interesting question. I think that the data collection for that task would be rather difficult and the set of languages you could sample from would unfortunately be rather small. But anyone who's really interested in that, um, you, if, if you are, you should please reach out to me or Kyle and, and we can talk about what kind of data you might need to be able to assess that. Okay, thank you for the answer. Next question. Uh, that from Canon Price, no need to go into the details, but how did you build your Bassinian model? Custom coded stem model, another mo method? He needs clarification. Yeah, um, so the model, uh, the model I printed here was in BRMS. Um, there's also a custom coded stand version that tries to predict that entire, uh, based the entire language matrix at once, yeah. um, which is harder to fit. So there's some like kind of interesting modeling issues there, which I'm happy to yeah talk about offline. But okay, thank you. Next question from Peter: How does or can the Bayesian model distinguish? languages that have a category, example number, but they not have conquered in that category from the second languages that lack the category completely. Is this or could this be done using language name category, example language, UG number? Similarly, the presence and the absence of categories like demonstrative versus the presence and absence of conquered. Yeah, so um, once so we've and the, the model kind of treats separately basically a set of walls features wh which include things like um, does it have the category and then the dependent variable statistically speaking is presence or absence of concord. Uh, so that leads to this issue that Mark mentioned that I think in the kind of whatever an ultimate version of this we will address, which is that you can have a language which does not have a gender system, like it, it's it's um, logically possible in the model space to then predict gender concord even without a gender system. Um, so basically, I think we want to we basically handling these points in a queer way. Um, I think would make that uh, yeah, we'll make the model better. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have one more question from Elizabeth. Uh, there might be a subfamily of a larger language family where the subfamily has conquered throughout, even though other languages in the family tend not to have it. If a given language is part of that subfamily, 
then you might expect it to be more likely to have nominal conquered than languages and other subfamilies. Is that a good way of, inclu of including that idea in the type of, stat of a statistical math uh, model you are using? Yeah, so we could, so right now, basically, statistically speaking, we have language nested within area uh, and then language nested within family. So it would be straightforward to also have language nested within subfamily, nested within larger family. Um, we didn't do that because the, the Mark's database um, tries to get a pretty diverse sample. So there's not typically not very many um, subfamilies within family since any given family doesn't have like a huge, it's not like there's, you know, a hundred different Indo-European languages like there are in some samples. Um, I think the like ideal thing would be to have a kind of richer notion of language relatedness and area relatedness that kind of gradiently tries to account for all of the kind of rich ways that languages can be related and takes that into account in the model. Um, but then there's always a trade off, but then the model gets really complicated and hard to fit in different ways. But yeah, that's a good question. Okay, okay thank you so much, uh, Mark. Thank you, Kyle, for your presentation. Uh, now we will go to the third section of our session with Shannon Bryant. Shannon? Hello. Okay, please. Uh, because of time, I would like you to do it like really very quickly. Okay. Um... okay I'm, I'm sorry, the time really flew very quickly. So I would ask you just to do all your best. I know it's very okay. challenging. Um, I, I Taking into consideration, there will be questions. Okay. For Thanks. you after. All Thank right. you. All right. You, so Sharon. as as quickly as I can go while still being intelligible. Um, today I'm going to be presenting evidence from a Romo on the typology of complementation strategies. Uh, let me just actually fix my view really quickly. Okay, there we go. Now, recent work by Wormbrand and Loninger proposes that languages distinguish three categories of causal complements, which are hierarchically ordered with respect to their syntactic complexity. In this talk, I'll propose that Oromo, a Cushitic language spoken in Ethiopia and Kenya, also shows this three-way split, but that the distribution of complement categories is a little different than what's been reported in other languages, suggesting some flexibility in the way that con common concepts can be linguistically encoded. Now, I'm going to start off by giving a brief introduction to Wormbrand and Loninger's 2020 synthesis model of complementation. Then we'll dive into looking at clausal complementation strategies found in Oromo. I'll walk through some key syntactic, semantic, and distributional properties for each strategy, and I'll show how these data line up with the synthesis model. And finally, I'll conclude with a summary and a nod to some open questions and future directions for this line of work. Now, it's no secret that we find ample variation among uh, complement clauses, even within a given language. This includes variation in the syntactic and semantic complexity of the embedded clause, as well as in the integration with and dependence on the embedding clause. Now, in his 1980 typological study of causal complementation, Shivan establishes a correspondence between the syntactic coding of the complement clause and the semantics of the embedding verb, giving rise to the hierarchy that we see here. As this bottom scale shows, the further left you go in the hierarchy, the greater the complexity and independence of the causal complement. Now, it's important to note that this hierarchy is implicational. So if a complement belonging to a certain class has some feature, say temporal specification, then all of the clauses to the left will also have that feature. Building on this view, Wormbrand and Loninger motivate three broad semantic categories of causal complements that comprise supersets of Givon's distinctions. Following the terminology and definitions of Ramshin and Spinonius 2014, they label these categories as propositions, situations, and events. Propositions, which commonly appear in uh, speech and epistemic contexts, may include discourse linking parameters and are temporally independent with no pre-specified tense value. Situations that which appear in emotive and strong attempt contexts lack discourse linking parameters and though they are temporally specified, their tense value often depends on the embedding verb. And finally events which appear in implicative contexts uh, lack both discourse linking parameters and temporal specification and they tend to involve obligatory control. 
Now, though these causal categories are ultimately semantically defined, they're crucially distinguished by the minimal syntactic structure they contain in line with Ram Shannon Spinonius's interface framework. As shown here, propositions minimally include projections belonging to the C domain, situations require projections of the T domain, and events only require projections of the V domain. From this, the implicational nature of a hierarchy falls out. Since propositions necessarily include the projections found in situations, they must be at least as complex as situations. Same goes for situations as compared to events. And though some languages may not distinguish between all three categories regarding certain morphosyntactic properties, while others may encode even finer grain distinctions within categories, Wormbrand and Loninger propose that this implicational complementation hierarchy applies universally. In addition to motivating three categories of complement clauses, Wormbrand and Loninger also argue for a synthesis model of complementation. According to this model, verbs don't select for complements of certain syntactic categories. Instead, the distribution of clausal complements is constrained by the semantic requirements of the embedding verb. As they show, this model allows for flexibility in complementation and correctly predicts the meaning shifts observed of verbs that can occur with more than one complement type, as exemplified in the contrast between the English sentences in 1a, Sue forgot that she finished the problem set, and 1b, Sue forgot to finish the problem set. Now with this model in place, we're in a position to ask the central question of this talk, how does aroma fit into the picture? I'll propose that aromo exhibits three categories of complement clauses in line with Wormbrand and Loninger's model. However, the distribution of complement categories found in aromo suggests somewhat different fault lines than those proposed by Wormbrand and Loninger. Rather than the distribution shown here, what we instead find looks a little more like this. With situations occurring with a wider array of verbs, including strong epistemic attitude verbs, and with a mixed pattern emerging for in, uh, other oriented implicative verbs. Now, before I dive into data that supports this picture, just a quick note on where it came from. Uh, original data presented here was elicited from two adult native speakers of Walega Oromo as part of joint work with DT Vajra on Oromo attitude reports. I also rely on data from the literature, and for this, I have noted the variety of Oromo wherever possible. Okay, so jumping now into the first type of complement found in Oromo, which is shown in two, Gomachun Robajra Jade. Gamachu said that it's raining. A few things to note here. This sort of clause is finite. It is unrestricted for tense and aspect and is compatible with main clause as sexual morphology. It's also unrestricted with respect to the type of predicate it can embed, allowing both verbal predicates as in two and five, he said that they came, as well as nonverbal predicates as shown in six, I said that Chao Tu is blind. Complements of this category appear alongside speech verbs like jet, say, and lapsad, announce. And they also show up with content nouns like odu, news, and damsa, message, with which they contribute to the informational content. As we see in seven, it is my message that humans be careful. Interestingly, though, complements of this category aren't found with non-speech verbs, including strong epistemic attitude verbs like aman, believe, as shown by the unacceptability of the example in eight. Now, this may lead one to wonder whether this type of complement isn't merely quotation. And there's a lot of work that can and should be done to diagnose the quotational status of Oromo speech complements. But as a start, notice in nine that matrix negation is able to license embedded ne negative polarity items like Camu any. Furthermore, of Harar Oromo, Owens 1985 observes distinct tonal patterns in direct quotes and what he calls indirect quotes, like the example we saw in five. Now, these points suggest that Aroma speech complements aren't necessarily quotation. Therefore, based on their similarity to matrix clauses, we may conclude that Aroma speech verb complements are categorically propositions, minimally extending into the C domain. Turning now to the second complement category found in Aroma, here we in fact find two embedding strategies. The first, verbal nominalization with subject, is shown in 3a, Gomachun de Chasa Refaju Chusati Amana, Gomachu believes de Chasa is sleeping. The second, embedding under Akka as, is shown in 3b, Gamachun Akka de Chasa Rafajuruti Amana. Again, Gamachu believes de Chasa is sleeping. Now, as this pair of examples captures, these two embedding strategies appear with the same set of verbs and contribute the same sort of meaning, exactly what we would expect under the synthesis model of clauses that belong to a common category. 
Contrasting with propositions, which have a rather narrow distribution in a ROMO, uh, these clauses appear with several sorts of embedding verbs. In particular, one or both strategies have been observed with strong epistemic attitudes like amant belief, emotive attitudes like abdat hope, strong attempt verbs like gafat ask, and interestingly, with the other manipulation implicative verb, goad make. Now, this distribution departs from what's reported in uh, Wormbrand and Moninger, where the clausal categories that appear alongside epistemic attitudes and implicative verbs differ from the category that's compatible with emotive attitudes and strong attempt verbs. Nevertheless, I'll argue that the complements that appear with the sets of verb, this set of verbs in a Romo are all instances of situations rather than propositions or events. Now let's look at some examples that support this claim, beginning with examples with verbal nominalizations with subject. Now you'll notice in these examples that verbal nominalizations with subject uh, include the full array of verbal arguments, all of which may be explicit. Further, as we see clearly in 10, we know he's going to Walega tomorrow. They also permit temporal specification distinct from the time associated with the matrix clause. Now, this reveals that aromal verbal nominalizations with subject minimally contain projections belonging to the T domain. On the other hand, you'll notice that these clauses are non-finite. The verb is not inflected for aspect or subject agreement, and as shown in 11, only paraphrastic negation is available. This suggests that the T domain contained within verbal nominalizations with subject is structurally deficient. In the place of verbal inflection, we find a nominalizing suffix ooh, which licenses a possibly resumptive uh, genitive subject, and the overall distribution of the resulting nominal is the same as what we find with underived nouns, appearing as direct object, subject, and genitive specifier. Now, you'll notice in 12 that in the latter function, the nominalization supplies the topic of nouns like odu news, here the news of take us killing a lion, rather than its content, contrasting with what's found with propositions. Now, this data gives us good reason to conclude that verbal nominalizations with subject in a ROMO are categorically situations, minimally extending into the T domain, but not constituting full clauses. This conclusion is in fact consistent with the observation that cross-linguistically, nominalization is far more common with situations than with propositions. But recall that this is only one of the two embedding strategies that fall within this category in Aromo. We still need to address the other, category, the other embedding strategy, uh, embedding under Aka. Now, at first glance, these two embedding strategies look rather different. Like verbal nominalizations with subject, ACA clauses do include the full array of arguments. And as we see in 14, I believe it rained yesterday, they also permit temporal specification. But unlike verbal nominalizations with subject, ACA clauses, ACA clauses are finite. Verbs embedded under ACA are inflected for aspect and subject agreement, as in 13 and 14. And as we see in 15, they also permit affixal negation. So you might be wondering, are ACA clauses not just finite CPs? And it's true that most descriptions and structural analyses treat ACA clauses as CPs, with ACA serving as the finite complementizer on par with English that. But there are several properties that distinguish ACA clauses from the propositional complements found with Romo speech verbs. First, as noted already, ACA clauses have comparable distribution and meaning contribution as verbal nominalizations with subjects, signaling that they uh, contribute the same sort of semantic object to the composition, contrasting with propositions. Relatedly, ACA clauses pattern with verbal nominalizations with subjects in requiring a verbal predicate. As we see in 16 and 17, embedding of the nonverbal copula da is disallowed and the verbal copula ta is required instead. Now, we already saw that embedding of a nonverbal copula is permitted within propositional complements, and Owens 1985 uh, observes that it's likewise licensed within relative clauses. So, this isn't a general restriction in a Romo. Rather, as argued in Bryant and Batra, the need for a verbal predicate. Re reflects the requirement that this sort of complement specify a situation, something that nonverbal predication fails to do. Additional evidence that ACA clauses are situations rather than propositions. Um, first, we see that it, only future orientations are available under certain verbs, including fed, want, and god, make, 
even when the action is understood to be completed by the time of utterance, as in the example in 18, Terfa made Gemtesa kill the lion. Furthermore, looking at beyond complementation contexts, we find that alcohol clauses also have a temporal adverbial function, expressing immediate interiority, as in 19, as soon as Tulu went, Baiza came. Now, when I wrote the abstract for this talk, I thought that alcohol clauses also contrasted with propositions in disallowing embedded WH interpretations. However, upon further investigation, it turns out that's not the case. ACA clauses do allow embedded WH interpretations, as we see in 20, suggesting that they may contain projections of a C domain after all. But then again, as we see in 21, so do verbal nominalizations with subjects, which are certainly not full clauses. Now, additional research is needed to determine exactly how much structure we find in these examples, as well as to determine the licensing requirements on a robo WH elements more generally. But in any event, it's important to note that within the synthesis model, mismatches between syntactic structure and semantic category are possible as long as the additional structure doesn't induce an overall change in meaning. In the words of Wormbrand and Loninger, a vacuous syntactic CTP domain without the operator's Saturna situation into a proposition will be mapped into a situation exactly like a CP-less TMA domain. And so, I propose that ACA clauses, just like verbal nominalizations with subjects, are categorically situations, minimally extending into the T domain, but crucially lacking the C domain projections that build propositions. So now we can turn to the final type of complement clause found in Aromo, exemplified in four, Kitaba Berachu Egalan, they began to study the book. Now, just like verbal nominalizations with subjects, these clauses are formed by affixation of the nominalizer U to a verbal stem and have the distribution of underived nouns. However, in this case, the subject of the embedded clause must be covert and is obligatorily controlled. So for instance, in 22, he refused to go, the implicit subject of demu go is necessarily controlled by the likewise implicit subject of the matrix verb deed a refuse. Complements of this category appear alongside self-inducement implicative verbs, like deed refuse. They also show up with other manipulation implicative verbs like dok prevent. The latter is exemplified in 24, he prevented the woman from going. And you'll notice in this case, the implicit subject of demu go is controlled by the matrix object, niti woman, rather than the matrix subject. Now, interestingly, Owens 1985 observes that some verbs can in fact appear with verbal nominalizations both with and without overt subjects. For verbs like bake no and fade want, the difference is reported to be merely emphatic. But for verbs like iran fad, forget, the choice gives rise to a difference in meaning, just as we see in English. When paired with a verbal nominalization with subject, iran fad expresses a factive nice. attitude, as we see in 25a, I forgot that I read the book. Uh, when paired instead with a verbal nominalization without subject, Iran Fad expresses a, uh, an unfulfilled intention, as in 25b, he forgot to buy meat. Now, this shift in meaning reveals that verbal nominalizations with subjects and without subjects belong to different semantic categories. So together, we can, uh, this data leads us to conclude that aroma verbal nominalizations without subjects are categorically events, only requiring projections of the V domain. So to summarize, aroma complement clauses come in three semantic categories. The type one propositions are encoded as finite clauses without complementizer. They're unrestricted for tense and predicate selection, and they're found only with speech verbs. Type two situations are encoded as non-finite verbal nominalization with subject and as finite aka clauses. Though temporally specified, clauses of this complement show restricted predicate selection and with some verbs, restricted tense. And these clauses are found with epistemic, emotive, and strong attempt verbs, as well as the implicative goad make. And finally, type three events are encoded as non-finite verbal nominalizations without subjects. They involve obligatory control and are found with implicative verbs. Now, the overall distribution of aroma complement clause categories are shown here. And as we saw already, this distribution departs somewhat from that observed in Warren, Brandon, Loninger. But crucially, uh, consistent with the implicational complementation hierarchy, the difference is found only around the edges. 
Now, of course, this is only a first look at aroma complementation from a typological perspective, and there remains a lot of work to be done. First, we should like to know how robust the categorical distinctions proposed here really are, and a more systematic examination of the uh, properties that distinguish propositions, situations, and events is in order. In light of Warmbrand and Loninger, we would predict situations and to differ from propositions uh, with respect to the availability of embedded reference time. We would also predict events to differ from situations with respect to temporal specification and perhaps some restructuring behavior like long passivization. If it turns out that the claims made today do stand up in the face of additional data, we might want to know why the distribution of complement, complement clause categories is different in Aromo than in other languages. Uh, for this, we need to consider the overall uh, inventory of functional elements that are available in the language. And I can talk more about that in the Q&A. So to wrap up, uh, aroma causal complementation lends support to Wormbrand and Loninger's tripartite synthesis model of complementation and is consistent with the implicational complementation hierarchy. At the same time, though, Oromo exhibits a distinct verbal clustering from what's reported in Wormbrand and Loninger with a wider array of verbs appearing with situation complements. Situating aroma within the typology of causal complementation thus sheds light on the diversity of ways in which basic semantic building blocks may be incorporated into the expression of complex meaning and speaks to the import of understudied language in typological research. Thank you. Okay, Shannon, in one minute, you're going to answer this the question. Great. Is there a passive in Oromo? If so, is it possible with all these types? And that question is from Mark. Great. So there is a passive um, formed by a passivizing suffix. And in fact, I don't know if it's available in all of these types. And it would be really interesting to see if that is the case. Okay, thank you. One minute left. If anybody has a question, and Shannon, you have to answer the question within one minute. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm sorry for this, but there is nothing we can, we can do. I have to follow the instructions. Okay, we're done. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for, I'd like to thank all the presenters uh, for this interesting session. And uh, should anybody has any questions, please send the questions by email to the presenters. Um, Kyle is asking if um, anybody can stay. No, the administrator is going to close the session automatically. It means uh, it's not a question that you can stay or not No. If you have any questions, you have to send it by email. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, bye. Tell you bye for now.